Thanks for your time. Much appreciated. You live here in Los Angeles now, is that right? Or? I do. Actually, I live here. That's, uh, I think people might be, find that a little perplexing. Uh, you know, why, why L.A.? You know, I, um, I came out here to work on this album and write it, actually. I just needed a change of uh, scenery. I've been living in New Orleans for a long time, so on and off since 1990, I think. And it just, uh, it just felt kind of stale. You know, I needed to see, have a different view out the window. So I also kind of wanted to be around some other people to do what I do. And, you know, it's, it's part of my nature is to isolate. And I think um, living in New Orleans was a good way just to kind of hide from the world. And it worked for a while, but at the end, I, think I just needed to get out of there. So it's been good. I really enjoyed being out here so far out here. Are you into uh, like sort of the outdoor elements of LA, or you look really bulky? Or have you been you know working out and things like that? Uh, yeah, I've, I've mountain bike quite a bit, and it's tougher to mountain bike in New Orleans where there's no mountains. <laughs> <laughs> so it's cool, like in your backyard, to have you know hills and trails and things like that. I read a quote the other day from Billy Joe of Green Day, and he said, when you're young and angry, it's sexy, but when you're uh, you know, a bitter old man, it's a different story. Do you ever sort of think about uh, you know, the anger in your music and your age and how they sort of relate? Uh? Yeah, I mean, I've thought a lot about, you know, I feel like I've kind of come out of a coma, and it's like I'm trying to figure out, wow, how did I get to be this age, you know, because I've skipped a few years somehow. And, um, you know, when I've sat down to write... I've always tried to have the main criteria just be to be honest with myself about how I feel about whatever it is that I happen to be writing about and, and try to be as brutally honest and not cater to anything other than what excites me as an artist and as a person and you know as long as it feels valid to me and feels sincere um, I'll do what I do under the moniker Nine Inch Nails if it's appropriate you know, but I see that having a finite lifetime. I would hate to think I would ever be in a position where I'm faking it to get a paycheck. You know? And frankly, on that topic, I, uh, you know, it's been four and a half years since we've toured or I've been on stage. And a big question for me was wondering if this is going to still seem valid and, f and relevant, you know, when I put a new band together. As of right now, we've played a handful of shows that went as good as I could have hoped, you know, it felt, it felt real on stage. I don't feel like I'm playing a role of someone I used to be. Um, it feels uh, relevant, it feels valid, and I'll, I'll continue to do that. I'm, and I'm very happy to say that it feels that way. You know, not that I would sit here and say that it doesn't feel that way, but I'm telling you the truth, and it, it does, believe me, it does, you know. Were you also at all nervous about um, you know going back and performing, being being clean? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, my last you know the last times I played, the last year of touring in 2000 was being sick every single day and lying to myself and living in this terrifying world of um, being physically addicted to something. If I didn't have a drink before I went on, I'd get sick, and it was just terrible. And it was that was soul-crushing year, face, you know, just bad, bad time. And i got to admit, you know, the day of the first show, I woke up nervous, you know, and it wasn't like I want to go have a drink. It was just like, I hope I don't feel that way before I go on stage, you know. And uh, I didn't, you know. I went on, and it was a great show. And the next day, I kind of thought about it, but not really, and then I didn't even think about it. It just became how I remember it being before that last year of touring. You know, it was something to look forward to. And it's fun playing live. And I, it's great to look out and know that I can't wait to play these songs for you. And I'm not dying on stage while I'm doing it, you know, which no complaints right now. I, w I was going to ask, did um, um, sort of hearing what, what Johnny Cash did with Hurt um, at the time you were working on this record, did that have any influence on you, do you think? Yeah, I mean, the whole Johnny Cash thing came up at a time right when I was about to start writing this record. And I was kind of in the, technically in my time off phase, you know, but what was going through my head was really questioning um, my own relevance. And I was wondering if I 
had anything to say or if I was any good and just kind of really thinking about those things. And Rick Rubin, who's a good friend of mine, called me up and asked me if how I'd feel about Johnny Cash covering Hurt. And I was just flattered. Okay, great. And I think I kind of assumed it would be one of a hundred songs they might you know, try for an album. And then a while later I got a CD in the mail. You know, it surprised me that I felt a bit kind of invaded, like, like his voice was in my song and it sounded funny to me. I wasn't in the mood to really listen, I was doing something else. And then not long after that I got the video in the mail from Mark Romanek and that was, uh, that's when everything kind of goosebumps, wet eyes, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I couldn't believe how emotionally powerful um, that video was and how that um, Johnny Cash could um, juxtapose his life against my words in that song and just felt incredibly powerful and um, just felt really privileged to be involved in that in whatever abstract way that I was, you know. And <clears throat> sad that it became the context you know, in his life and which context it ended up becoming at the end of his life. But um, it's a very flattering situation to have somebody that's such an immense talent and icon as him and great songwriter asked to sing your song and then him turning it into this thing that really beautiful. And it felt like... Um, it felt really, at the time, it felt really comforting and like a pat on the back in a way of like, you know, you can do this, get out there and write an album. And, you know, it felt good to me. You know, I'm very flattered to be involved in that cool. whole situation. And you were originally going to work with Rick, and um, he, d he did sort of, you know, work with you and on some level, I imagine, um, just being a friend. And... Yeah, I started this record off um, really pretty afraid to see if I could write, you know, I was afraid to kind of test that out in my new world and life I was living. And I started talking to Rick, and Rick's been a friend of mine for quite some time, and it was really a good, a good thing, to, a good person, a good amount of input to have around, and um, kind of as a mentor. When I came out to L.A. after that to um, start writing, I would check in with him and send him songs and start with feedback on that, and there came a point when um, a part of me just felt like every, my confidence had grown, my, I've never felt more strongly than I did at the time about what I was working on. And I felt like I need to just do this my way, my, I need to see it through the way I would see it through, for better or for worse. And it wasn't against me ideas Rick had, it was just every, cell in my body of, of an artist said, just do this record the way you would do it, you know. Because I didn't feel short of ideas and I felt like I had a plan and I felt like um, I just want to do this. I don't, I don't need to approve it by anybody. I just really need to do this thing. And I'm happy with how it turned out. I don't know how it would have turned out, you know, and I never will, but it was, um, I feel like it was what I needed to do at the time. You also work with Dave Grohl on this record. Tell me, uh, you know, did you, were you friends before? How, when was the first time you guys met? Uh, I met Dave on a tour we did in um, uh, Australia. We were on some, something together, big day out. And I'd seen him occasionally, you know, but, and we were acquaintances, and I always seemed like a really nice guy. But when I was recording this record, you know, um, I had my drummer, Jerome Dillon, play on about half of it, and then... Um, there were some things where I just kept saying, you know, kind of a Dave Grohl type drumming, Dave, and I finally caught myself saying it, and I thought, why don't I just call Dave Grohl and see if he'd do it, and we did, and he could, and a few days later we were in the studio, and it really, really was a great, great experience, you know, he brings, not only is he a really nice guy, and he, but as a musician, he, br he brought an understanding to the material where I could play him a demo, okay, let's do it, and walks in the room, and knows what to add. You know, he really had a real musical kind of feel for what was happening. And I have nothing but good things to say about that, you know, and made a friend in the process. You also worked with, with Zach, who uh, we haven't seen forever from Rage. Um, yes. <laughs> how did that come about, and, and, and you know, what were the results uh, of that collaboration, I guess? 
Um, with Zach, I, I got a number of calls saying he wanted to work on some stuff, and um, I didn't know Zach at all. You know, I liked Rage Against the Machine a lot, but I, I didn't know anything about him as a person or if he was what what his abilities were or anything. But um, we got together for a number of sessions in New Orleans, um, just working on some material that personally I thought turned out really excellent. You know, and over time, I think, frankly, it was just a matter of Zach not being sure what, what direction to go. You know? And I know the feeling of being kind of, you know, it's basically fear, in my opinion. You know? and you're not sure what you want to do, and it's the next big step. You know? And he's in the difficult position of leaving a, one of the best bands of the 90s, you know, when they were at their peak. And... Um, you know, he wants to make an important statement when he makes it. And, and he will when he, when he does get around to making it. You know, and I, I like Zach. It was, you know, right off the bat we hit it off on a friendship level. And he'll, he'll be out with something and it will be good. You also, a while ago, did some things with Maynard uh, um, Tapeworm. Is that ever going to surface? Uh, um, probably not. <laughs> you know, really in the time off time that I've been talking about, uh, there were some other things that I weren't high pressure things I was just messing around with. Um, most of them failed. And the thing with Maynard was one of them. Like, I like Maynard a lot, and I, I really think he's probably the best vocalist out there today and, and um, a good friend. And a group of us kind of got together and tried to work as a democracy and work on some stuff. And um, just didn't seem like it was that great to me, you know what I mean? To, just to be honest with you. And, I figure if we're going to work together, it's got to be the greatest thing ever, you know. And it didn't feel like that to me. And plus, it uh, it just got complicated, and it seemed like the best to not mm -hmm. pursue. Uh, I'm also, not covering up any stories. There. It's really just yeah, what it was. You know, yeah, I just felt like it wasn't. It needed to be great, and it. I don't think either of us had the time to dedicate to make it great, great, and it was kind of pretty good. And I wouldn't put a record out of my own that I thought was pretty good. So, that's that. Now, you said that uh, you got sane during the uh, making of this record. Is, uh, has music always been sort of a therapy for you, and was this album more so than, than previous albums? Music's always been a way for me to try to feel better and get better. And I, but I think, the, I think the inspiration is coming from a less destructive place than it, used to be. You know, my life really just kind of crashed and burned. And I got, uh, I had to come to terms with being an addict, you know, which was something that I had for a long time lied to myself about the status of, until it really was, I couldn't lie anymore because I was either going to die or I had to get better. And there wasn't any, I couldn't go forward. And um, So a few years ago, I did what I needed to do to get my life in order. And took the time off because I didn't know if I wanted to do this anymore because I'd wound up in a terrible, terrible place and I wasn't sure what got me there and I wasn't sure if I could even still write or if I had anything to say. And it came out of a, it was incredibly therapeutic because I found that well, I can write and now I can actually think again and I like myself again and I'm more enthused about working than I think I've ever been and I feel like I'm not um, kind of anchored to this black cloud that's going to take me down, you know, that's going to descend on me. And I hear it in the record now, not only thematically what I'm talking about, but taking certain chances or allowing things to sound a certain way because I felt more confident than I had and I wasn't as afraid what someone might think or, you know, I felt good about things for change. And I'm not saying it's a happy record, I don't think it's a joyous, have a party type of album. And it's exploring a lot of feelings of coming out of that cloud and um, trying to figure out who I am or what I am and with a lot of fresh, terrible experiences to think about. But I, Now, with, uh, with Teeth, the first thing that I kind of struck out to me was that um, you know, there seemed to be more piano on it than, than I you know, recall from other Nine Inch Nails records. Is, you know, do you write songs starting on the piano? or? Um, it kind of changes from, it depends on what the situation is, but this record in particular with Teeth, I, I wrote it in a very different way than I'd written the last couple. Um, like with Pretty Hate Machine, the album is really like the, 
twenty thirtieth revision of the demos, you know, culmination of years of kind of perfecting it. And then by the time I did Downward Spiral and the Fragile, I had a, a studio to work in, so I would write in that environment and write in the studio. And what I'd find is that um, songwriting and the arranging and production and sound design process all became the same thing because I was in the same room and I was just kind of a song would start with a, a sound or a drum loop or maybe a, an idea for a visual or something and eventually a song would kind of emerge out of it and that was the song and this time around I thought it would be interesting to get back to starting with lyrics and words and really separate the process into songwriting and then arranging and production. Mm -hmm. So when I came out here, I just set up a piano, drum machine, and a little computer to record vocals into. Only allowed myself like 10 days, two songs at a time, over and over. And wound up with demos that were just piano, vocal, drums. And I think that's why when, I, when, I got, when it got time to then take the best of the best and arrange them in the studio, which I went back to New Orleans for, I found that a lot of the space the piano took up, it, it sat nicely. Because I started off thinking, okay, now I have to get a cool sound to replace that, and I can't use the piano, and I've got to use... And it, it dawned on me that, you know, it sounded good in there. You know, and it wasn't out of laziness, it was just out of that's really kind of... There was an odd sound with, like, kind of violent live drums and this kind of cold, brittle environment to have a piano anchor everything together so it just wound up that way it wasn't really the plan but it turned out that way yeah yeah that sort of contrast seems to fit with the, a lot of the lyrics and I mean is that uh, <clears throat> kind of what you were thinking is it just seemed to make sense you know like I didn't I, I went in I started this record with uh, the idea that it wasn't going to be lush and it wasn't going to be layered and a million different things like the fragile was I wanted to make it just pretty austere and down to just what needed to be there. Just the only, if it only needed three parts, then it was only three parts. And um, as the songs started evolving, I think from writing them the way I described, using, doing demos and starting with words and simple music, they came out more like song songs, you know, and it, less soundscapey and more like a, an actual thing. And it, the whole tone of the record kind of turned into this um, stripped down, for better or for worse, kind of songy type record. So it felt like the right thing to do. Let's talk about the hand that feeds. It's doing, it's doing really well. I mean, it's, it seems to be on the radio every time we turn it on. Uh, um, tell me maybe a little bit about the track, uh, sort of the history of it, I guess. Um, hand that feeds was a catchy song right off the bat, you know, and. and I allowed myself, I was so kind of irritated and fed up with the political situation in this country that it slipped into the lyrics and I couldn't stop it from happening. All with the kind of, well, I don't know if I'll include it or not. And that's kind of my safety blanket. If I'm writing something and I'm unsure, well, it's up to me if I'm going to include it. And I'll just roll with this for now and see what happens. And I can always throw it out or hide it somewhere. And it just turned out as something I felt good about. You know, and I didn't feel it was too heavy handed in terms of what lyrical content and um, I don't feel like the last couple of records really had many songs if any that announced themselves the first time you played it as a as in something you can latch on to and the response has been great and unexpected and kind of uh, just rolling with it right now you know? I know for me <clears throat> Nina Snell's albums have always been uh, um, very much an anecdote for a, a, a breakup for me. It's certain parts of my life are like a big fight with a woman, uh, yeah. things like that. Um, you know, w is it safe to say that this is a you know a relationship uh, influenced album? Uh, There's relationships, but it's not necessarily romantic relationships. I'm discussing that much on this. I mean, a lot of it, a lot of this was my own relationship with myself, the world at large, where where I might fit into that, trying to find a place to fit into that. Um, come to terms with my own ego and you know I learned a lot in my life that primarily I don't know everything that was a new concept to me you know I'm not as smart as I think I am you know I'm not particularly that different than the next guy I'm not always the exception to the rule you know and um, also my relationship with the disease it's gonna kill me if I don't deal with it you know that came very close to doing that and 
but hopefully disguised enough that it's not a terribly boring record about, you know, uh, recovery and addiction and that sort of nonsense. Mm -hmm. With the title track, uh, there's a part where you repeat the I can't go through this again, and it's probably the most intense moment on the record. Uh, you know, would you mind kind of sharing about maybe that is what you're meaning there? Or, um, well, with that... You know, I'm, I'm not one, I, I don't really like to get into lyrics and what they're about that much just because I think it kind of doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, what's always been the songs that have meant the most to me, they're what I think they're about, you know, and it's always better than what the guy that wrote it's about, you know, or when you mishear a lyric and the one that you've thought you've heard is better than the real one when you finally see it. Um, so, but, I mean, that particular song, now that I've just said that, was me versus this disease that's going to kill me, you know, and that was what I was flirting around with on that. On the, a lot of the songs deal with that, but it's kind of, um, I like books are better than movies because you design it the set you way you want it to look, you know, and it's, I don't like to have my personality or what I'm up to outside this room or overshadow what I think the most important thing is, which is, to me, the music. 